I thought since it's the last lecture, maybe I could have some fun. And um, so here's a, an idea. So let's start with the same setup as before. Suppose we have a symplectic manifold. Um, M omega um, with a Hamiltonian action. Not necessarily toric action of a torus um, K and moment map mu from m to k do. Suppose further uh, that the image of the moment map is a polyhedral set. So what I mean by this i.e. mu of m is intersection of some finitely many hyperplanes. I'm um, sorry, half spaces. So for example, you could have something like this. I think Cho Hyun is not here, but he drew pictures like that. <laughs> oh, you're here. Here, here's your picture. <laughs> so, so here's a thought that occurred to me. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if you could just take another hyperplane or another half space and just do something like this? Cut off a corner. Or maybe then take another one and do it again and get a polytope. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to pick a rational, say, half space H and um, produce a new symplectic manifold, <coughs> symplectic um, I don't know, let's call it MH omega sub H mu H M to K do. with action of K, Hamiltonian action of K, these are the moment maps, so that the moment map image of this new guy is the moment map image of the old guy intersect H. So you could just take the polytops and stop chopping them up by hyperplanes. Notice so call this operation a cut by H. Note if we can pull it off, then given a unimodular you have to be a little bit careful about conditions um, polyhedral set 
let's say, uh, P in Rn dual, um, um, so P is intersection of finitely many of these guys, um, we can produce a toric Tn manifold, um, T low n manifold with, uh, let's call it M omega mu, M to R n dual with mu of M equals P as follows. And so if you believe that you can do this, here is a cheap construction, which is not the one that Tamo was using in his lectures. It's sort of, that one looked very complicated. You pick the normals, you write down some linear maps, you have to find the kernels, you have to do something. This is just, you know, cheap junk. Um, so what do you do? Um, start with, Let's call this guy um, MP, omega P, mu P. Right? So you start with um, M, the one we're going to chop up to be the cotangent bundle of TN. So this is TN cross RN dual. The symplectic form is the standard one. It's summation D theta I dpi, so the thetas are the angles and the p's are the momenta, and one, and you can easily see that dg theta j contracted with omega is dpj, so mu from tn cross rn du to rn star that takes theta in p and just sends it to P is a moment map. And now you apply this machine. Chop, 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 chop. Now cut by H1, get, well, Rn star intersect H1 as image, and so on. Um, so, so corresponding to of, say, M1, omega 1, mu 1, and then eventually you get to um, m sub n, omega n, mu n, with mu n of m n being mu n minus 1, m n minus 1, intersect h n, and that's the intersection of h i. Okay, so we need a theorem of some sort. <laughs> right, this is sort of the basic philosophy in, in this business. Um, toric manifolds are polytopes, so maybe if you can do things to polytopes, you're really doing things to manifolds. So here's the theorem. Uh, let's make, call it symplectic cut. Um, it's not the author of the theorem. But that's what I want to call the theorem. So what does it say? Let me do, um, let's, let's do the simplest version first where you start with a circle action, right? If you understand circle actions, it's not too hard to understand products of circle actions. 
and, and things are no more complicated. So suppose m omega mu m to r is a symplectic manifold and mu is a periodic Hamiltonian. Um, I.e. we have an R mod Z action and mu is the moment map, is a moment map. Okay. Suppose there exists a value of the moment map so that Um, so this is my circle. S1 acts freely on mu inverse of C. And if you remember yesterday's lecture, not that I do, but if you do, <laughs> um, that tells you that C has to be a regular value of this map. That's forced. And so this is actually a submanifold of co-dimension one. Um, then there exists a symplectic manifold notice that half spaces on the real line are very simple, they erase um, so here is my half space C infinity the notation is a little bit heavy but I'm trying to be consistent so here's my moment map so that uh, one, the image of the moment map is what you think it should be um, two, well there should really be some close relationship between this new manifold and the old one. Right? So the picture that I have in my mind is here is your manifold. Um, here's a moment map. Here's a regular value. And um, you know, you could naively just set of point, take the set of points where mu is greater or equal than c. But that's a manifold with boundary. Um, it's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a manifold. Right? I, I, I'm thinking of manifolds with boundary as a different sorts of beasts. So you have to ha somehow get rid of the boundary. And so let's see. But away from that problem with the boundary, right? Everything is nice. There is an open symplectic embedding. Of the sets of points where mu is greater than C, right? If I forget about the boundary problem. So I want it to be some sort of compactification of the open piece. Well, how would you compactify the open piece? Well, what is it? It's the level set of the moment map. So maybe we could just kill the circle action. Which seems like a strange thing to do, but let's do it. So if I delete this, this big piece, open piece, I claim that what I should get is the reduced space. So this is symplectic. S1 equivalent. So these are the claims. That you can actually do this. And it's a, it's not a very hard idea. 
So let's pretend we're topologists. Uh, it's a topologist at winter school, right? <laughs> so first pass to the proof. So I thought I would do the proof in two steps. In the first one, I would just try to do what comes naturally and it will fail. And then we'll know what the issue is. Um, so since action of S1 on mu inverse C is free, C is a regular value. Um, and mu greater or equal than C is a manifold with boundary. So define a relation tilde on this manifold with boundary by um, an equivalence relation. X is equivalent to X prime. Well, if and only if either X equals X prime or if X is not equal to X prime. Let's see what I want. I want only to identify the points on the boundary that differ, that sit in the same circle orbit. So let me try to write that down. X, X prime is in mu inverse of C and X equals tau times X prime for some tau in S1. <coughs> So I claim that that kills the boundary. And you get a, at least a topological manifold. So what happens locally? Well, um, the neighborhood of mu inverse of C and M looks like, remember it's a regular value, so it's a submanifold, it has a tubular neighborhood, it actually is a trivial bundle, so it's mu inverse of C cross epsilon minus C, ah, epsilon minus C, epsilon plus C for some epsilon bigger than zero. Something like that. Um, maybe this is not completely right, but no, th this is okay. Right, this is the inverse function theorem. You meant C minus epsilon? Uh, C minus epsilon, yes. The first one is incorrect. C minus epsilon, C plus epsilon. Right, low, you take a low neighborhood. And as long as you don't, it's something like this. Maybe it's not the neighborhood of the whole submanifold. You need some properness. But if we're computing things locally, this is good enough. Neighborhood of uh, mu inverse of C and mu greater or equal than C um, looks like, well, mu inverse of C cross um, C plus epsilon, right? Now let's think about this guy, uh, mu inverse of C is a principal S1 bundle over the quotient. So what's the neighborhood? The neighborhood then is S1 cross C, C plus epsilon bundle. Over the quotient. And 
And the equivalence relations are really on fibers. So what's my fiber? The fiber is this open cylinder, right? And what's my equivalence relation? Right, this is, this is the closed interval, half open interval. The equivalence relation just collapses the circle to a point. So dividing by tilde does this. And if, well, it doesn't look like it, but it's a two disk. Right, if you're a topologist, you can tell the difference. <laughs> a cone in a circle is a, is a disk. So you could see that if you, locally the boundary disappears. Is a topological manifold. C0 manifold. Maybe I should uh, write down an example. Is that a good idea? Yeah. So here's an example. Let's take um, let's take m to be c to the n, and let's take mu of z to be one minus norm z squared. Um, let's see. Does that work? I'm um, sorry, let's take it just to be z squared. Which way am I cutting it? Yes, I think this is a good idea. Right. So what does the image of the moment map look like? Right, it's, uh, it's like this. Here is one. Right, when z is zero, I get one, and I get everything below it, right? So I can take c, and what's the, where are the singular values of this map? It's quadratic. There's only one singularity. At the origin, which goes to one, so if I pick any value below the origin, I could just look at uh, mu greater or equal than c, well, what is it? That's one minus norm z squared greater or equal than c. Right? Um, so that tells me, see that I did right? So that, which is the same thing as saying one minus c is greater or equal than norm z squared, right? I'm looking at these points in the complex n space. It's a ball, right? And c is less than one, so this is something positive. And now I'm looking at the ball and I'm dividing things out, identifying points that sit on the fibers of the Hopf vibration, right? And what do we get? Right? And then you could, if you think a little bit about this, or if, if I intimidate you by my authority, this is CPN. No, N. We haven't changed the dimension. The boundary is CPN minus one. The boundary becomes CPN minus one. The rest of it is CPN. So you get the cell decomposition. Right here is a big cell where this is strictly bigger than zero. <laughs> where, you know, the, you get the interior of the ball plus another cell that comes from the, you know, a bunch of cells sitting in the boundary. Right? So the claim of the theorem really is that you can do it smoothly and symplectically.
So right, the question is, what about C infinity and symplectic structures? So let's try again. So consider M cross C uh, with the following symplectic form. There is an old form on M, and I'm going to add something like square root of minus 1 over pi dz wedge dz bar. Um, with diagonal action, with the action of K, which is again R mod Z, but I'm going to give it a different name because we'll be half, half a dozen circles floating around, half a dozen circle actions, so I want to distinguish them, uh, given by... You see, we have an old action of a circle on M. There's an action of the circle on C, rotations. So there should be an action of the circle in the product. You just have to pick the right one. And I think the one that works here is the old action here and e to the minus 2 pi square root of minus 1 tau z. The stupid factors of 2 pi is because my circle is r mod z, or some identifications. Right? The corresponding moment map f from m cross c to r is f of m z is the old moment map minus norm z squared. So this is what I want my moment map to be. And whatever your sign conventions, flip the signs either on the form or on the action. <laughs> so the moment map comes out this way. Right, so what are our assumptions? C is a regular value. Well, action of... So how can we check that C is a regular value? of f, very different map. Well, you could, if you're good with differentiation, you could probably check it. Uh, but I'm lazy. Here's one. And we know there is another way. You could just check what the, what the stabilizers of the action are on the level set. Well, f inverse of c is pairs m z and m cross c such that mu of m minus norm z squared um, equals c. And I can break it up into two pieces. If z is 0, mu of m is just c. So those points are there. So this is a non as 0 in the complex plane. And then if z is not 0, well, I know its length. So I can look at, then the rest of the points have to look like, well, some phase factor, and then uh, mu of m minus c, square root of. Right? m is in, so mu of m is bigger than c. Right? I want this to be positive, and uh, e to the i theta arbitrary. Now let's look at the circle action. Let's look at the action of k. Well, let's see, what's my action? It acts on the first component and rotate the second. Here, there is no second component, it's a fixed point. 
but we're safe because we're looking at the level set and there the action is free. Um, so I don't know if I want um, kx freely here. Freely by assumption. What about the other guy? Well, you can always change the phase, and that's free. K action here. So even if it fixes a point, it doesn't matter because it's spinning the other coordinate. So the conclusion is C is a regular value. So I know that if I set the manifold MCM infinity to be the symplectic quotient, is a smooth this is a smooth symplectic manifold. And for the algebraic geometries, the whole thing can be carried out using JIT equations. Right, there is a dictionary. So you translate. Well, I'm not sure if you can do this algebraic. Anyway, I digress. So we've got a smooth symplectic manifold. Let's check what it um, let me go through right, where does the circle action come from? Right, I claim that there is with this one action Well, let's see. The, the action of S1 on M extends to an action on M cross C. So tau acting on M comma Z is tau M Z. Right? That's why I call the other circle K, otherwise it gets very confusing. <laughs> or should I say more confusing? <laughs> right? So we have a circle action floating around. It, you can check that it preserves this level set. Right? Because it preserves this equation. It preserves the condition. Right? So if you rotate M, nothing happens. Right? It preserves F inverse of C. Hence, descends to an action on this manifold. Now, what about the moment map? It also descends. So mu m to r extends to mu m cross c to r mu of the new extended mu, well maybe I should put a tilde here, of mz is the old mu of m. Now restricted, it's k invariant. I guess I should say mu tilde. Right? If I rotate M and Z, well, it doesn't matter what I do to Z. And if I rotate M, nothing happens because mu is invariant under the all action. 
sorry, this ends. To, I don't know, mu hat. I'm running out of various symbols. I don't know if you can know the difference between tildes and hats. So an exercise is to check that that's actually the moment map for the action. Right? And what's the, what's the image of this guy? Well, um, what does it do? It's mu hat. Let me write um, m bracket z for the um, orbit of m mod z and f. Right? Oh, in, the, in that level set. Well, it's mu of m. Right, that's how you push functions down. But now you see that we tossed away what are, all my, what are allowable m's in my level set? Well, the either value of the moment map is c or it's greater or equal than c, greater than c. So it just has the right image. What about all these embeddings floating around? No, well, we have an embedding. Um, mu, if I look at the sets where mu is greater or equal than zero, uh, c, I can embed it into f inverse of c. Um, what does it do? I can take m and send it to O m square, square root of mu of m minus, minus c, like that. It's smooth on mu greater than c. At mu equal c, it's a singular, there is a singularity. Right, because I'm taking a square root. All right. So J of intersects every K orbit. And parameterizes them. Let's say it inter. Let me not lie too much. It intersects every k orbit inside the set, right? Because what's the rest of the points here? Well, you have to add a phase factor here, but you can always freely do it, except for when this is zero, but then it doesn't matter. And so some orbits get intersected. Um, so when mu of m is bigger than c, that intersects a k orbit in exactly one point. Otherwise, it intersects the orbit of k in a, in a, circle, act, in a circle orbit on mu inverse of c. Right? So, if, so that tells me that this, if I compose, Uh, 
circuit. M goes to is onto. And if you look at this, if you squint a little bit, what are the points that get identified? Well, they get identified when this is zero. And that's exactly by the S1 action. So it descends J, the composite. So this map to a homeomorphism uh, from mu greater or equal than C mod this equivalence relation Maybe it requires a little bit of work to see that it's actually a homeomorphism. All right. So you see where this equivalence relation came from. It's sort of forced on. But another thing, nice thing is that this is, by construction now, a smooth manifold. What's not completely clear is the relationship between smooth structure here and smooth structure on the manifold with boundary, or between the symplectic forms. Well, let's see. So that does, um, so I proved this. Um, so let's do these two. Well, let's see, if I look at mu greater than C and shove it into F inverse of C, um, so J, again, is an embedding that intersects every K orbit in exactly one point. So what you get out of is that if you look at the, if you follow it by the projection, uh, so M goes to is a different morphism. Well, I shouldn't say differ. I should say an open emitting. The differential is actually bijective. All right. What about the symplectic forms? Well, if you've computed enough symplectic quotients, you know what to do. Where does the symplectic form come from? Where does the symplectic form on the equation come from? You take the two form here and restrict. Um, I want to compare it with the form here, so let's take this restriction and pull it back. Okay, so let's see. Moreover, J pullback of omega plus this stupid thing. Strictly speaking, you, you restrict it to this submanifold and then you pull back. But restriction is a pullback, so I'm going to absorb it into all my pullbacks. So what is this? Well, this is omega plus, um, and there was a square root of minus one here, square root of minus one over pi d of this square root, which looks kind of horrible, wedge d of the square root. which is zero. So let's call this map J bar. It's a symplectic embedding.
right? You, you should really think what we're doing is we're parameterizing a piece of the quotient. And if you check what the symplectic form is, it's the one you started out with. And what's left? So if I look at the rest of the image, well, this is points of the form m comma zero, mu of m equals c. In other words, it's mu inverse of c minus one. And this is actually a symplectic detail. You could check the exactly the same way. So let me not put any more details. Let's do an example. So notice that it puts a very amusing structure on CPN. Right? It's a symplectic structure where the open ball embeds. <laughs> it's actually the standard one. Another example. And let's take this moment map. Um, just norm squared. So this is length w1 squared plus length w2 squared. So the action, the symplectic form is one, uh, square root of minus y over pi dwj wedge dwj bar j from 1 to 2. <laughs> Standard flat symplectic. All right. And the action is again the one we know and love. W1. Let's do this. So any value of mu except zero is a regular value. So let's look at, so the question I'm asking, um, what's What do you actually get? Well, it's, you just compute. So m cross c is c2 cross c. f of w and the next parameter is going to be norm w squared minus length z squared. f inverse of c is wz so that length w squared minus length z squared equals c. Let me rewrite it as wz. Um, length w squared is c plus length z squared. 
So notice that if I know, um, in some sense, this should be parameter. This whole thing should be parameterized. This set or this manifold should be a sphere across a real line, a uh, complex line. Because all you need to remember is the direction of W, not its length, and Z is arbitrary. So we have a diffeomorphism. that takes some point on the three sphere and sends it to, well, you have to rescale it. And then Z. And you can make it equivariant. So what's the circle action here? you rotate W's in one direction and Z's in the opposite direction. So you should rotate the um, vectors in S3 in one direction and vectors in C in the opposite direction. And we're getting a line bundle right after you divide out. And that's the teleological line bundle. So it's O minus one or something like that, right? But we also produce the symplectic form on the zero divisor. the symplectic form on the zero section um, let's call it L of L over CP1 is Maybe I'm not saying it right. What I want to say is we have this symplectic form floating around. Right? I've, I've constructed it. Because we've taken a symplectic manifold and carried out quotient. It's something. And so the symplectic form on F inverse of C mod S1 restricted to the zero section of L over CP1 is um, a multiple of Fubini study. And which multiple? It depends on where you've carried out your reduction. Questions? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> um, well, one way you can see it is you can look at the level set and see if it's compact or not. This one is clearly unbounded. But there is another way to see it. Um, so let me answer your question indirectly. Note, C2 has a T2 action, not just an S1, right? 
there's a standard action of the two torus on C2. It pushes down this action of T2. Remember when we were discussing um, this cut construction, I started with a circle action in my original manifold and pushed it down. But the only thing I needed for it to push down is to commute with the action of K, to compute with this funny diagonal or circle action. So if I have something else that commutes with that diagonal circle action, it will push down. Okay. On C2, it pushes down to an action, to a Hamiltonian action. action on this cut space. Right, that L should really come with a parameter. That's the size of the exceptional divisor. And the moment map image is, well, what did we do? We um, um, we started out with a moment map image of C, which looks like x1, x2, x1 greater or equal than 0, x2 greater or equal than 0, right? So this is norm z1, secretly this is norm z1 squared, sorry, w1 squared. And this is norm W2 squared. Right? This is the, I'm writing the image of the moment map for the action of the two torus in C2, right? So it's this guy. And with, what did we toss out? What we have really done, right? Um, I excluded all the vectors whose length is less than C. Right? So, the new moment map image looks like we're intersecting with this half space. So the new image, the image of C2 infinity under the induced T2 moment map is this. And this is C and this is C. Or maybe C, You're right, it's exactly C. Uh, it's it's unbounded. Right. In the in the other example, you're getting this triangle. Right. This is why everybody writes down the image. They write triangles and keep talking about projective spaces. I figured that at some point this should be explained. And this is probably the cheapest way to see it. And then if you squint a little bit, you should probably read off the uh, first churn class of this line bundle in the slopes. But we know what it is anyway. So by mucking around with equations, you can actually do a lot of things. So let me make a remark.
Maybe it's several remarks at once. So suppose, I'll switch my notation. Suppose m omega mu m to k du m is a symplectic manifold. with a Hamiltonian action of a torus. Okay, so I, I, I finished proving the cut theorem, the symplectic cut theorem, so okay now is just an arbitrary torus floating around. Um, so recall um, ZK, this is the kernel of the exponential map from K to K. I guess I should say points of parameterize circle subgroups. Right, if I have a vector, it goes to the subgroup that looks like exp cv. Right, since it's in the kernel of exponential map, right, it just says that the period is one. So all these lines, right, if I take an arbitrary direction in Lie algebra and exponentiate, it may or may not close. I could just get an irrational wrap on the torus. But the vectors in the integral lattice are exactly circles, circle subgroups. So if V is primitive, so that word has been thrown around a lot, i.e. V prime equals lambda V implies for some v prime in the lattice implies that lambda is plus or minus, sorry, the other way, plus or minus one. V is not a multiple of anything, except for minus itself. Then exp tv this circle acts on m omega with moment map. Well, this is um, sort of, there's half a dozen ways of, um, I guess I'm rephrasing something I've said before. Or maybe I'm repeating something I've said before. You take mu and you pair it with v. Right? If, if v is not sitting in the uh, integral lattice, this is just the flow of some vector field. But since I picked them to be in the integral lattice, they're periodic. So now if this arm, if this, this circle acts freely on mu v inverse of c for some c and r, we get, well, this cut space. It's not hard to see that this manifold um, carries a Hamiltonian action. of the original big torus K. 
Moreover, what do we get as the moment map image? Well, it's the original moment map image intersected with points in K2 so that mu v, oh, let's see. It's, it's intersected with this half space. So here, here's the picture that I promised you. Here is mu of m. And here is v. And in this picture, we're cutting off a corner. And the important thing is, we can iterate this. This procedure by picking different vectors. And in the integral lattice. So for example, if you want to construct a Dilson polytope, you just take the normals. What's, what I'm hiding under this is the fact that you actually get free actions on all these level sets as you keep doing this cutting. But it works. And that's where the unimodularity comes in. Right, and I have three minutes left. So here's a bonus theorem. So a symplectic manifold So if I have a P and Rn do has a vertex So this is polyhedral set has a vertex n at most n facets. If an, so the, the claim is what can, what can you get as a reduction of Cn? Um, Mp, the corresponding symplectic manifold, is a quotient, is a symplectic quotient. of Cn by a subtorus. So now if I start picking arbitrary polyhedral sets, you might, may or may not be able to get them as symplectic quotients of Cn. Remember the the construction I sort of sketched at the beginning was start with a cotangent bundle. Well, it's really C star to the end. I, I deleted a bunch of things. But say you want to make sure that you're just doing reduction of the original flat CN. Then you can just get arbitrary polyhedral sets. And the condition is it has to have one vertex. So half planes are no good. Half spaces are no good. And um, this end fits that end. But um, 
I'm out of time, so I can't prove it to you. <laughs> so I'll stop here.